I have to ask before we go to Viktor Frankl, if if you're able to put words to it, in what ways do you think reality is deeply strange? Can you elaborate on that in any way? There's a narrative aspect to it. There's a religious aspect to it. There's an, a meaningful aspect to it that we don't understand. We can't understand it scientifically, or we haven't been able to. The scientific viewpoint excludes that to some degree. And I think the best evidence for that probably does come from hallucinogenic experience. Now, people have, clearly, people have a biologically instantiated religious instinct. Now, it's possible that that only speaks of our peculiar biological nature, that it doesn't reflect broader reality as such. But if you go deep enough into the psyche, what you it becomes increasingly difficult to separate what you discover from reality. Now, it's not people can clearly have individual subjective religious experiences. Most scientific phenomena are objective. Many people have to experience the phenomena at the same time. You have these religious experiences that can be induced by hallucinogens, let's say. Each person has their own particular experience, but everyone has an experience that's similar. And we don't know what to do about that category of experience. And then, you know, we think in stories and we see the world through a structure of value. I think that's, I think that that has been proven beyond a doubt by neuroscientists and psychologists. And the fact that we see the world through a prism of value seems to indicate that there's something about value that's real. And so that's partly why things are deeply mysterious. I mean, Rick Strassman, he terrified himself right out of the DMT research, as far as I could tell, because all his subjects came back and said, well, you know, I went somewhere else and saw aliens. It's like, well, it was a dream. No, sorry. Wasn't a dream, was way more real than any dream. In fact, it was actually more real than life. Well, what do you do with that? What do you do <laughs> well, with especially that? when it's all whether it's every subject or almost every subject yeah, exactly. and not one, one out of thirty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, no one knows what to do with that. We don't know what to do with that at all. And yeah, I, I mean it it's it's beyond comprehension. It is deeply, deeply strange. You know, one of the images that I uh, I paused on in one of your lectures online, it was an older lecture, I believe, was a side-by-side -side comparison of two drawings, one of, or I should say, a piece of artwork of the Scandinavian tree of life yeah. and the Peruvian Amazonian <laughs> tree of life. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, if you want, if you don't mind taking a moment just to describe that, or I could try to recall it, uh, it, it was it was really striking, and then you and then you shortly thereafter had a had a drawing your son had put together, and the overlap was uh, really hard to wrap your head around in 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 some respects. No, the drawing my son made. Yeah, I have it in my office. He was about six when he made it. It's stunning. On one side, there's a forest full of pine trees, and then there's a river running down the middle. And then on the other side, there's a town, but the town is all mushrooms, like like uh, Amanita muscaria mushrooms. So all the houses have mushroom caps, and so there's an order. There's order on one side and chaos on another, and the river runs between them. And then out of the river grows a beanstalk, and the beanstalk stretches up to heaven. The clouds are there, and Saint Peter's there by the gates. And like, it's not like my son had any particular Christian religious education. Like he didn't. We didn't go to church. And I, I saw him draw that and I thought, that's unbelievable. I can't believe you drew that because it's it's a shamanic drawing. It's chaos and order. Those are the two subsets of existence. Right at the point they meet, out of the river grows the tree of life. It reaches up to heaven. That And the shaman, they, crawl, they climb the tree of life and they go to heaven. And, you know, when Merche Eliab, people who studied the shaman, many of them thought that, if the experience was drug induced, that somehow it had been pathologized, that wasn't part of the actual tradition. But I think that's completely wrong, is that people have been using psychoactive drugs to transcend their consciousness for God only knows how long. One of the most interesting hypotheses I ever encountered, I think that was Terence McKenna. 
he thought that psilocybin mushrooms and human beings co-evolved. Yeah. So who knows, you know, um, the stoned ape hypothesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, and what's, it, what's furthermore interesting is that we are not the only species who seeks altered states of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, I have a little book about animals who seek out psychoactive experiences, flies even. That's why Amanita muscaria is called, uh, what is it, the fly, fly agaric, because flies fly will, agaric. will go uh, eat I didn't know that. stoned, yeah. Yeah, yeah, even <laughs> flies, reindeer. <laughs> even flies. Yeah, it's uh, very strange. It's very, very strange. It is. It is very safe to say that we do not know what to do with that. Um, yeah. Well, and we don't. We also don't. What we also don't know what to do with things we don't know what to do with. You know, that's the problem with opening Pandora's box. Is that if you have your life reasonably well conceptualized, and then you have an experience that indicates to you that you just don't know what the hell's going on at all. It's like, well, yeah. what do you do then? Yeah. And in fairness, this is. Uh, maybe a subset of what you're describing, but a term I was introduced to by Roland was ontological shock. Yeah. And the fewer of those, the better. <laughs> yeah. For that reason, these are not compounds to be taken casually. Well, ontological shock produces post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a whole literature on ontology. They don't call it ontological shock. It's generally termed something like disruption of fundamental axioms, but it's exactly the same idea. You know, and one half of that's terror and the other half is awe. And that's why trips can go bad because you can, you can get the terror side of the ontological shock. Which is also why the therapeutic wrapper that is used by, say, Hopkins or by MAPS, who is working with the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, is so important because these compounds can re-traumatize or traumatize if, you, or if used in an irresponsible way context, or even if used responsibly, quite frankly, right. that risk exists. Well, because even the safety pre precautions that are put in place, they can certainly decrease the probability that the trip will be negative, but that doesn't mean they alleviate the ontological shock. They do it at the moment, so it doesn't go astray during the trip. But, you know, there's still the long-term sequelae to, to consider. I need to use that word more, sequelae. That is a great word. Uh, 